they didn't scam Airbnb. They scammed the guests that booked the Airbnb. What they would do, they would have these listings all over the country in multiple marketplaces and create multiple listings at different prices for one property. Welcome back. Chris Crone here on The Chris Crone Show. I've got TJ to Johnny. TJ, yes, how are we doing, brother man? I'm doing great, great, great. Back in Utah. I so like, I like we have here. got to talk about yeah. this real estate market because you bring yeah. a very, very different flavor and mindset uh, and approach, mm -hmm. perspective than what I'm doing in the game. Absolutely. Playing this hardcore single family game, over $2 billion transacted. But dude, you are um, you're you're in the Airbnb boutique game. Yeah. You're in the small hotelery game. You're yeah. even um, I hear word on the street is you're even moving up into some of the bigger games yes. like Marriott. Absolutely. So we're gonna talk about all that today. Um, but first, a little bit of background for everyone about who you are. Like just three minutes. Mm. How did you get started, and where did you land, and what are you up to? Absolutely. So for me, I got started in real estate uh, when a friend handed me a book to read. I was an engineer. I ended up having to put myself through college. Um, first, my family to go to college. I graduated from the University of Houston, graduated with an engineering degree and a mathematics minor. Started did you actually end up like going into a career in engineering? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. How I much was, were you I making was, a year out, was, right out of college? Oh, man. Right out of college, I was at 110, 105. Okay, so you were already exiting college, six figures, yeah. twice as better off yeah. as anyone else leaving the college game, and you did that for how long? And I did that for five years. Now, granted, I was only making that much money out of college, which I even I understood at that time. That's not most people coming out of college. But my role as an engineer wasn't even just like a traditional role as in an office. I worked offshore. I was out in the rigs. I was out on, in the subsea installation vessels or in an installation rigs. Um, I was mainly stationed with Exxon. I was on a big project called the Julia Project right out the Gulf of Mexico. I would either drive to Louisiana and take the boat out. To the, to, the, to the rig, or we would take a chopper route from Louisiana to the boat. And Dude, that, that's gotta feel a little big time, right? You're oh, young, that's gotta be an exciting oh, career. Yeah, yeah it, was, it, was, it, was, it was amazing. Um, I was given the option too. I was like, man, do you, do you like, there was like, I can make 75 in the office, or I can make six figures working out in the field. So, but that came at a cost, that cost was my time. I was working, I was gone maybe 60% of the year, 70% of the year, out in the waters working Hard to have a life. Projects. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then I was handed a book. You can probably guess what book that was. Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Okay. <laughs> of course. He handed me that book. He said, bro, TJ, I watched you put yourself through college, man. You a hustler. You need to read this book. And I took that book with me offshore on a project. I read it three times in three weeks while I was there. And that was a light bulb for me. I need to get off this boat right now and own some assets ASAP. So it's interesting. You, within five years, had developed pain in that career. Oh, yeah. It, yeah. All it took was five years for you to like... I, do you feel like young people these days are seeing it sooner than the previous generation, which they're like, I've been at my job for 30 years, I'm miserable, I don't like anything at all that I do, but it's the only way. Like, Well, well, I'll, t I'll tell you what, let me not glamorize this for any, for any sense of purposes because I had to, because I started off wholesaling. And because most of my time was offshore, I'm over I'm trying to talk to sellers while I'm offshore. And you can imagine how challenging that was because internet was literally scarce. It was very limited when you were out there. And so I'm over here trying to close deals and make deals while I was offshore. And my goal at the time, I wanted 10 single family homes. I'm like, okay, my salary as an engineer, if I get to, if I can get ten single family homes, I'll be good. And that was my goal to get that. Can you tell me leave. why ten homes? What what income did you think they were going to produce? So I was I was anticipating four to six hundred dollars a month cash flow. So you're like, if I have five to six thousand dollars a month, that might be enough to walk. Yeah. And maybe reinvent. And, and, re, and re, exactly, then go all in. That yeah. was the mentality. June 1st, 2017, I got the tap on the shoulder. The inevitable tap in. If you folks who don't know, the oil and gas market is very finicky. It can go up and down. When the price of oil was, had tanked to like $42 a barrel from $100 a barrel, and I was wrapped up with my Julia project, they literally did not have any more work for me. Oh, so, and, did, so oh, yeah. did this transition happen when you lost your job? Yeah, this transition happened when I lost my job. I, I, was, I was halfway into my goal. I wanted 10 single family homes. I had five when I was laid off. And so I was laid off. I had to tap on. I went to work early that morning, went to the gym that morning, got to my office. That same manager that hired me, who doesn't even work in my department, he came and tapped me. I hadn't even seen him in like two years. I said, Preston, what's going on? Man? He said, man, TJ, we got to talk. And so I went to his office. He said, man, I want to be the one to do this because I was the one who hired you. We wish we can keep you. We just don't have enough jobs for the amount of engineers that's on this that Dude, on this if you right. imagine if you were one of those people out there that read books and never take action and you had no hopes. Crazy. Exactly. Like you'd probably just be, go out and get another job. Well, and, and what's crazy is I, that was the decision. It was like, do I go back and get another job and stay the course to get to 10 or do I go all in now? And I decided to go all in right then and there. 
one of the hardest things I've ever done. My first deal in real estate was a bad one. I, it was a six-figure loss of my own money. My first deal Jeez. into real estate as a full-time. How did school. you lose? Oh my! I, it was my first high-end flip. If you heard, you probably okay. Heard, so you were you got into a luxury. I got into a, deal. my first high-end. There's a flip. You bought in at what price? Come on, oh just, my God. just I was like, rattle, I was, up, rattle off the numbers, man. Four hundred seventy-nine thousand. So you're in four seventy-nine, and you think after repair value, seven hundred eleven thousand. Seven eleven. That was ARV. Okay, that was the ARV. So, so you had a difference there of basically three hundred thousand dollars. Put ninety into a remodel. 90 so you put ninety in. in. You're thinking I'm going to make a hundred six figure exit. You make at least hundred grand. Exit. How did you lose hundred grand? For one, if you heard in 2017 that the hurricane that hit Houston heavy, Harvey, that yeah. hurricane Harvey, that hurricane hit that neighborhood. Now this neighborhood, high end neighborhood. Wait, wait, you tell me on this deal. That you had a hurricane hit your house? No, no, no. An act no, of God? No. The, the hurricane didn't hit my house during the time. This deal was after the hurricane. Okay. So hurricane had already happened. This neighborhood had never been riddled with a flood before. This house is one of the very few one-story houses in the neighborhood full of two-story mansions. This one-story house flooded for the first time ever, and we we're getting at a pretty deep discount. On paper, everything looked amazing. We we're going to flip it. We we're going to make six figures. Even though it flooded, we didn't think that would be such a deterrent because, for one, that's a 500-year flood is what they consider it. For two, that was one of the very few one-story houses in the neighborhood that you can get in the neighborhood for under a million and still take advantage of the neighborhood when most houses are over 1 million, 1.5 million. So we had those. We felt, we felt like we had those things going for us. And this house... For one, uh, we didn't realize what kind of buyer is buying a high ticket at a high end market. These buyers are extremely picky. We've had people that came in, oh my God, it's lovely. I, it's so amazing. So you're telling me that the house looked real good, oh, but when they looked pristine. at the history, they're like, car, salvage title. Yeah, exactly. Oh, it flooded? Yeah, we don't want it. Oh, this, I don't like that tree. The tree's too bad. We don't want it. It's, we don't want this house. So do you think you didn't go in deep enough on the luxury game? We went, uh, um, for the first one, I thought we went pretty good for the first luxury property. Granted, that was my first and last one. But for that luxury property, for that level, we went, we, we went with some pretty high-end finishes. Bosch, porcelain, porcelain tile. We went with the with the quartz countertop waterfall. We hit it with some nice stuff. Um, but it was so bad, even during while we were trying to sell it, it had like these super dope classic windows, like classics where you had to unspool it. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it fit kind of with the super modern thing that we were hitting, getting, giving it, but we didn't, hit, we didn't realize what kind of hit and miss that was. People would come in, oh my God, I love these windows. Some people would be like, man, and those windows are ugly, man. So during, while we were trying to sell it, we came in, tore the windows out, and put brand new windows in it. That property was supposed to sell for $711,000. We ended up selling it for five eighty. dollars When you sold it for five eighty. dollars when, when I sold it for five eighty, dollars I had to come out of my pocket almost 10 grand to sell it, to stop the bleeding. Yeah. And it took almost two years to sell it. So when you add up everything, in my head, probably about 150 k loss. If I really did the math, it's probably close to 200. Wow. Very first deal. Yeah. So by the way, we've all, we've all had those moments. Yeah. I mean, I, I went in after 2009. Hmm. The market had dropped out, hmm. and I was doing two different things. I was going into Phoenix, Vegas, Florida, and I was buying these three, four hundred thousand dollar houses on the court steps for a hundred, hundred and twenty, hundred and fifty grand. And within five years, we sold a couple thousand of those, and and we had wow. RV. We had we had uh, created over a hundred million dollars in valuation just on those deals. That was a win. But at the same time, I went into Ohio and Michigan, and I bought a tape of like a hundred and it's like hundred and sixty nine homes. I bought them from Freddie and Fannie at a 92% discount. Mm. And I put a million dollars in and I lost a million dollars on that exit. Oh, wow. And I was like, I thought I was going to make 10 million. That's I thought, right. worst case scenario, I'm going to make 5 million. I, had, I could not fathomably conceive wow. of losing a million after a 92% discount. Good. And it's because that market did not um, reevaluate fast enough. Mm -hmm. And I tried to flip the homes too soon in a mm. bad economy. I should have actually should've just held them. But in those particular markets, in the price range I got those homes in, those homes, uh, we, would, we would drop 30 or 40 grand in a house, and within six months, it would be re-destroyed back mm. to needing another 30, 40 grand. And it, know, it hurt. Wow. You, you know, you just said something that you, you, you try to sell in a slow market. You know what's crazy about this deal I just told you about that I lost in? This happened in uh, 2018, going to 2019. 19? 2018, 2019. Can you imagine if you bought, sold if that in 21? If I waited, here's, the, here's what's well, crazy. So All the, the loss I took, the biggest regret wasn't even buying the property, was, was not holding on to it. Yeah, because yeah, timing on was that not, market. Was ti the timing, timing was Timing on bad. that market. I bet that house today is worth well over a million. Well over a million. Uh -huh. If I had waited until 2021, Chris, I would have sold it for over 800. So this I already is, looked at it. This is, kind of an, this is kind of interesting about the game of real estate in general. This is why I do so much buy and hold, thousands of deals this way, is because yeah. it's like, and I buy them all below the median. 
like my average purchase price is probably like 250, 280 right now. Mm. So I'm buying at this price point where it's like, I don't care what the market does. I've learned how to win no matter what, because right. I don't like licking my wounds every five, seven years when something go down, I don't like. Right. Um, so you learn these lessons, you pick them up along the way. Absolutely. Um, so this is interesting, you oil rigging, <laughs> you lose your job, but you had acted earlier after reading the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Kiyosaki, changed yeah. a lot of minds, including mine. And you got your first five deals, and then the first thing that you did when you're out on your own is you go lose six figures on this big deal. Absolutely. And so it was like, okay, so luxury out is out for me. I'm not doing that one. I'm not doing that anymore. Where did you go next? I went into short-term rentals. You went to short-term rentals? I went to short-term rentals. Airbnb. I was, I was rehabbing a property that I was just going to make add to my portfolio, making a traditional rental. And I saw a video from Brian Page on YouTube, and he talked about earning money on Airbnb more than regular rentals. I said, you can make more than regular rentals. Which I hadn't even stayed in an Airbnb at the time. And so I started looking into it. And so I was like, all right, I'm gonna just try this Airbnb thing on this first yeah. property. And I tried it, I spent $14,000 to furnish this three bedroom, two bath house. And I listed it on Airbnb. Um, I, I was so nervous, I was, a, I was a fr- I'm like, man, what did I just waste all this money? And I listed it, I went home, I started watching a movie, Planet of the Apes, and I put my phone down. And then literally within an hour, a ping, but it was just an inquiry, it wasn't even a booking, they just had questions about the backyard. I said, oh yeah, it's a big backyard, it's spacious, all the space that you need is perfect, you can feel free to book it. They didn't book it, but I woke up the next day with two confirmed reservations the next wow. day. And that's when it hit me, and what's crazy is, And at the time, it was different back in 2017. It's not like it is right now in the short-term rental space. But back then, I priced it literally about half of what I'm seeing in the market rate for three bedrooms. So I said, okay, even at half, and I'm maybe 60% occupied, I'm still looking at 2x what I would. If you're doing rental. I'm still looking at about $800 to $1,000 net to me. I'm like, okay, maybe there's something here. And so this is what made me go all into short-term rentals. Then I learned, I got educated. You don't have to own these assets. And I said, okay, see, arbitrage is different now. But back then, man, we were going crazy with rental arbitrage. So you're doing a lot of creative financing subject Absolutely. to, you're basically taking over people's deals saying, I can make this thing more profitable than you. Exactly. But what's, you know, what's crazy back then, I wasn't even renting necessarily buying. I was buying properties with creative financing. I was buying them with the birth strategy. Then some of them, I would rent them. Yeah. So I'll rent, I won't even buy it, I'll just rent them and I'll convert them to a short-term rental with the landlord's permission, of course. So, you know, I never really got in the short-term rental game, but I got in the lease option game. Yeah. And, and I found out that I could yeah. consistently produce a double rent than I could yes. have a rental. It's like, this house I rent make 300 a month, I do a lease option, I'm gonna net six, 700 a month. So, so uh, in about two weeks from now, I'm gonna be speaking in Nashville and I'm literally gonna be teaching how to leverage lease options to scale your short-term rental business. That's interesting. It literally, is one of my favorite ways to scale. To me, you get to combine the best, the best of both worlds with rental arbitrage, renting, yeah. and owning. And so the way we did lease, because I, I love lease options. I love lease options, but I, I was doing it as an investor. I would put a property on a contract with a, uh, with a, with a, tent, with a seller, purchase agreement, uh, option agreement, and uh, a lease agreement as well. Then I will find a tenant buyer. The tenant buyer will put down at least 5% down. I would keep 3%, I give the seller 2%. That's my fee, wow. and, I'm, and I'm out of it. Yeah. That's how I did lease options back then. Got it. But see, because in Texas, you can't stay in, in the middle. You can't do sandwich leases in yep. Texas. Texas. So that, that, That's the nasty lease yeah, option state. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So we were doing lease options. So now, we are just positioning ourselves as a tenant buyer. We are making sure that we put down no more than 2% down, no more than 2%. We get credit from the rents that we get. We also get credit uh, in terms of a seller concession, that's just non-negotiable. We always get sellers, depending on the price of the price point of the property, you can make it between three to five thousand dollars. Nothing too crazy. Seller concession isn't money that the seller's giving you; it's just credit that you get if you execute the purchase. And so, uh, so yeah, that's how now we're leveraging lease options, renting the asset essentially, um, leveraging it as a short-term rental, making money from it, then executing the purchase, assuming we like the cash flow at the end of the. At the end so of the I, I got to ask you this because when the pandemic came around. Uh, basically all STRs, short-term rentals, oh, took yeah. uh, they got slammed. Oh, and my question is, have they ever really come back the way that they were? In other words, was the real golden era of Airbnb its first decade when we're coming out of 2008 and it was just like, it was hot until it wasn't? I, I personally, and you know, and I think you probably, you may get a different answer from depending on the host that you get. Me personally, being in this business since 2017, I don't think it has ever been the same pre-pandemic. I, you know, person, I don't think it's ever been the same pre-pandemic. Um, what happened after COVID? The Airbnb business, Airbnb saw about, 
in let's say COVID 2019, 2020, by 2022, Airbnb had about a 60% increase in hosts throughout the nation. 60% increase in hosts. Everybody started doing rental arbitrage. Market is saturated. Every, market, is, market saturation. And so, and even now, when you hear about the slowdown in Airbnbs, it was it went viral last year, where I think it went viral the year before, uh, about markets slowing down. You saw um, uh, houses that are sitting on the market that are on Airbnb not being booked. And uh, what you, the issue is, is not because Airbnb is slowing down, because when you look at it, Airbnb actually posed their highest summer last year, right? The issue is the increased supply. Even if Airbnb posed a 10% higher income, but you have a 30% increase in supply sharing over the 10%. And so, so that's everyone, so you're saying everyone's making less money, but Airbnb is still making out like a Oh, bank. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And everybody's making do you less th- money. Do you think that's writing on the wall that its days are numbered? I don't think its days are numbered, no. I don't think its days It'll are numbered. It'll always have a place, but the saturation should slow down the excitement, the investor category. And, yes. And there, there'll be less competition. It'll be less competition. And what's happening now is the Airbnb is going through a point where a lot of businesses go through. And this is a point to where there's there where because maybe because of the, the barrier to entry is so low, a lot of people flood it. Then they see how saturated it gets, and a lot of people dropping off. I am in different Facebook groups every day, and people are selling off their furniture, selling, getting rid of the Airbnb. Oh my God! It's but you're not. But you're not even doing real Airbnb. So I mean, you did you did high end luxury, mm-hmm. and that was awful. Yeah. Right. You started building your portfolio with Airbnbs. You built a portfolio, but you've been pivoting again. Oh yes. Oh, and yes. I and I do want to get to talk about the economy and your take on it because mm-hmm. 2024 is going to be, in my opinion, a crazy, I think so. very different year than what we've seen the last three years in real estate. But my 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 question is. This whole boutique mm-hmm. hotelery helped me understand this game. Absolutely. For one, let me first say that there's still plenty of money to be made on Airbnb. I don't want people to be discouraged about Airbnb. We still do Airbnb. We still, our students, our community. You just have still to be more Airbnb. discerning. You just have to be more discerning. You have to understand that you have to prioritize providing an experience, not just a stay. Yeah. If you prioritize provi- your amenities, literally there's, there's softwares right now that you can run comps, look at what top performing Airbnbs are doing and just mimic them. Like literally, what do they have that you don't? What's happening is because it's not so much, it, because it's a supply issue, but then you still have people like me, a lot of my friends, we're still 80% occupied, 70 to 80% occupied. But that's because Why? you're creating an experience. Because we're providing an experience. You've got we're, the we amenities prioritize and the things that nobody else does. We, exactly. It's and not enough just to say, I got my not, house, it's, not. it's Airbnb. Even and, if it's and, nice. And, and I put beds everywhere, and it's, it's nice. It's nice. So by the way, even nice is even not, enough. Here's what's crazy, Chris. You know, most people, when they want to get an Airbnb, they'll grab a, uh, you know, maybe a nice one bedroom, a nice yeah. house, get, you know, decent furniture from Ross and, you know, the, the sure. decent stuff. You yeah, know what I'm yeah. saying? Furnish it, you spend a decent amount, maybe you spend five to eight thousand furnishing a two two. And you know, you know, you come on, come all, come anybody that's gonna stay here. You're not niche down, you're not even prioritizing, you're not, you're not, you don't have no no color scheme going, you're not prioritizing the experience, you don't yeah. have no amenities, so no, I'm no in real Jap- amenities. I was in Japan last year with my family and we Airbnb this place mm-hmm. in um, in Kyoto that had all of the rooms themed like Pokemon. And they had, and it, it was so, my kids, I mean, we went to Loved Japan it. just for the anime. <laughs> and um, so my, you know, my son who's just all Pokemon crazy, oh, yeah, having yeah. these Pokemon rooms, uh, you, you know, uh, Snorlax, this really big, like the sleepy Love Pokemon it. is That's like, on it. the bed and Love that. all the sheets and, and, and all the themes. And I was nice. just like, when I went in, I'm like, this is one of a kind and there's nothing else out there. Like, and this is why my wife booked it. You see, and that's the thing. So you got to, so you got to be special. You got to have you something that nobody stand, else really has. You got to really. That's the only think, way you stand out. Exactly. So that, it's, it's it's luxury plus. Like it's it's just like it's not enough to be. It's not enough to be. And the really amenities. Nice. And the amenities. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And and to me, to me, even the oversupply in Airbnb, to me, Chris, it's not even a bigger issue right now. That's not the biggest issue with Airbnb. Um, I'm literally. We just shot a, a recorded a story about a guy, I don't know if you know this, it's new news, there's two, two guys that are getting sued right now because they scammed $8 million on Airbnb. Jeez, how do you scam $8 million, $8 million on you Airbnb? You know what's crazy, Chris? They didn't scam Airbnb, they scammed the guests that booked the Airbnb. What they would do, they would have these listings all over the country in multiple marketplaces and create multiple listings at different prices for one property. And they will bid them against each other, pick the highest one. The rest of them, the rest of them, they'll either cancel them, not give them the refund, and let them deal, deal with Airbnb with it, try to get the refund from Airbnb. And then they'll, of course, now the list Airbnb is flat. Airbnb was slow on the uptake. They were very slow. They did this for two years. They, they did this for two years. Collected $8 million Collected in deposits $8 million on a whole bunch of fake years, non-existent rentals. A bunch of fake non existent And so here's the bigger problem. I think, you just defi- I think you just define what cryptocurrency feels like to most people. <laughs> but, you know, and, and you know that's, a, that's a really good point because you can imagine 
the, the guests that were swindled in that in that situation, do you think, what are the likelihood they're gonna book another Airbnb? Oh, yeah, no, or their faith in Airbnb? Guess what they're gonna do? They're gonna now stick with hotels. You know, this, you know it's really weird, but when we were, we were scheduled to go to Japan during the Olympics that got canceled because of the pandemic. And we had over $100,000 in, in, in tickets for the games, and then also in just really nice Airbnbs. And we never got all of our money returned. Hmm. They found loopholes and they said what they said, and I was just thinking, huh, yeah. Airbnb, I think not, right? <laughs> and you, you see, just that feeling, right? And so now, just like your experience, when people experience that, and they, they get that feeling, they're not like, well, they're just gonna stay with a hotel. Because guess what, a hotel ha will always have beat over an Airbnb consistency because most what consistency yeah because most people if i, if I you can you can produce a certain experience so hotel so you're telling me that hotel versus airbnb they they've gone to war against each other and hotels have kind of won well i wouldn't say i wouldn't say they've gone to war against each other because now being in a hotel space and having a bunch of hotel friends hoteliers will tell you they just look at airbnb as just another brand yeah just another marriott hilton yeah. another marriott they don't necessarily of course you have the lobbyists and people that hated it and you know what i'm saying because this take it still takes some of their market share it definitely does take the market share the issue the thing is is that if I book a Hampton Inn here in Provo and I book one in Houston, it's the same Hampton Inn. Down to the bagel and eggs that they use for the breakfast. The Which is awful. Same. Which well, is awful, by the way. Those <laughs> eggs are... <laughs> but guess what? It's consistent. Yeah, it is. And most people would rather a 7 out of 10 consistently. Well, can I tell you the one thing that turns me off from Airbnb? Like, whenever we go somewhere in the world, my wife's like, oh, let's get an Airbnb. And I'm like, there's only a few situations where I'm cool with that. The biggest thing that drives me nuts is... I don't know what time of day I'm going to get in. I don't know if I'm going to get the key or if I can reach the person. Mm. And I've been in those situations where it's like, you I'm calling know. Airbnb to talk to the person, to talk to the person. Meanwhile, I'm sitting in my car for two hours just saying, let me in That's your house. And, it's, and I can't get in. That's such a vital point you make. And so when you talk about consistency, it's like That's there's a front desk at a hotel. Exactly. Ain't no you front ain't got to worry about Airbnb. that. You know you're going to go in and like, get your actually, key. Actually, when my wife ever does Airbnb, I'm like, like in advance, I'm like, you have to contact them yeah. and you have to tell them when we're going to arrive and you have to figure out how to reduce the mayhem exactly. of just how we access exactly. and get in. Or you get in and you have a question and sometimes you don't have those helpful pieces of paper that tell you what's up and down. Mm. So you can't turn on the pool or you can't turn on the whatever specialty thingy. It's like, hey, that's a cool amenity. I just don't know how to use it. Yes. Right. So. And that's. That's part of the bigger issue. No, no, no. Because Airbnb doesn't like enforce a standard on how they have to really run it. Like they're just collecting fees for saying, oh, you got a cool house, you got cool digs. Like we'll, we'll take a fee to, and we're basically a marketplace. And but I wish what Airbnb would do is say, hey, and if you want to be on Airbnb, there's a whole host of thingies that you got to do so that we can produce a consistent Airbnb experience. They with try all the to consumers. do that with super hosts. They try to put a different kind of standard in hosting with super hosts. Unfortunately, they tried Airbnb Plus. I don't know if you ever, you ever, you saw that, you heard about that when it was out a few years ago. Airbnb Plus listings were, were there. They did away with that. They stuck with the super host. Um, unfortunately, though, you still come, you can still book with a super host and have a bad experience. Unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> um, so the 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 thing is, the the inconsistency in the Airbnb market to me is the biggest downside to being in a short run business and yeah. booking Airbnbs because most people would rather a seven consistently yeah. than a two here, an eight here, Dude, a five you, here. Can I, can I tell you what, what turns me off about Airbnb? And this is what this is your genius and this is not my genius. Uh, so I, I've done some Airbnb and what I hate is when is I'm, I'm more hotel energy than Airbnb specialty energy. Cause like when you take a look at my last 1000 houses, they all look identical. Mm -hmm. They all have two car garage. Mm -hmm. They're four bedrooms, two to three bathrooms. They're all 1400 to 1800 square feet. The majority of them are within five years old of each other, a, a, a brand new. Um, and, and they're just the same. And mm -hmm. what's great about that is I produce a very consistent result out of that. Mm -hmm. Airbnb, I do one and it works great and I do another one it doesn't. And I'm mm -hmm. like, ah, oh, this there is some specialty knowledge required yeah. to do this game yeah. that I don't like. Yeah. But you got it. Yes. You 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 figured it out. Yes. And and um you know, I have the I have the fortunate blessing to to really see this business go from one one spectrum to where it is now. And I can tell you. Without unequivocally, when I first got started in Airbnb, you know, back in 2017, I probably could have picked up a couch off the street, a mattress off anywhere, just put it on my property. And, hey, I'm on Airbnb. And guess what? I would have made money. That was oh, then. That was then. Old times have changed. Me, when times change, many expectations have also changed. Mm. And so people expect a lot more when it comes to Airbnb. Yeah. And so if you are able to get into a market 
and you figure out how to provide an experience and to operate, I'll say maybe within the top 15 percentile, top 15 percent is getting most by 50 percent of the bookings. The bottom rest is competing for the rest of the 50 percent, yeah. right? And that's the what's happening. Right? But Airbnb also has some Herculean fees to the managers, right? The house cleaners and the people that basically get uh, that, that take care of it because it's not as easy as like a, a, a turnkey scenario when you have a bunch of specialty items and mm -hmm. things have to be treated a certain oh, way yeah. and then things have to be accounted for so pillows don't walk yep. off. Like you have to have all these extra systems in place that I didn't learn about until I got in that game. Oh yeah, you know, you know, uh, in a hotel, uh, I'll say like a regular Marriott or Hilton, the cleaners are paid per hour. Um, it could be under 15 to $20 an hour, but their time, it literally has to take 30 to 45 minutes per room to clean it will take four hours to clean one of my three bedrooms, yeah. right? And not even just because of the sheer size, because of what you mentioned, the extra things that's required. The like, did they put the remote back and did we actually clean it to say that this is a sanitized remote? Like all the details, man. <laughs> all those things, man. All those things. All those things, absolutely. They matter though, they yeah. matter. So, this, so you've shifted again though. You've been reinventing yeah. yourself some more. Yeah. And um, right now in Columbus, Ohio, you're you're in the middle of a twelve million dollar acquisition on Marriott. Yeah, on Marriott. And I'm like, are you buying Marriott? Are you buy Marriott for twelve million dollars? And you you kind of break to me like, Crone. I don't know if you know this or not. For someone that's in the real estate game, you may not know. Like, it's kind of a franchise deal. It is a franchise deal. See, when you buy a, a branded hotel, you're buying a business. Don't even get it twisted whatsoever. But it doesn't even feel that way. I could walk into a Marriott anywhere in the world. And I'm like, there's one. The Marriotts own this. <laughs> exactly. Right? You know what's crazy, Chris? Don't feel, I don't want you to feel any kind of slight. Don't feel bad whatsoever. Guess why? Most people don't know this. Hmm. Most people don't know when they see a Marriott, they think Marriott owns it. So you're they, telling me how they expanded is they built a brand. Yeah. They created standards. Yeah. They said things need to be renovated every five yeah. to seven years, whatever it is. Yeah. And then they just found people to come in and say, I want your brand name, yeah. and that's how they expanded. And, that, and guess what? It, if, if I own a hotel and I had a bad month, a bad year, guess what? Marriott still makes money, and they make the same amount of money. Because it's a royalty. Because it's royalty. <laughs> because it's royalty. What, what is a royalty? It, it depends, and it depends, depends between the chain. Well, since you're buying a Marriott, like, I'm just kind of <laughs> curious. Like, we're, we're, we're around 12 to 14%. So you had to pay a 12 to 14% mm -hmm. royalty. They make money no matter what. No matter what. And then do they just like, do they tell you how much staff and employees or things you need to create the consistent experience? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So all, all the way down to the staff. Um, now, you have creative control on your own property because that's what people need to understand. This is, just because it's a Marriott, we're using their brand. This is just another commercial piece of real estate, just like if you bought an apartment complex. It's just, but, but guess what? We get to put their brand on it and they have to approve us. For example, Marriott's one of the more stricter brands. If you've never owned a branded hotel before or some Marriott's a strict ass, they want, want you to be affiliated with them before they can even approve you to be like the lead person, right? If you've not, if you haven't been experienced with them, they won't even approve you to even put their brand on your, on your, on your building. So the thing is, is that they, like you said, have the standard. They set the standard. You still have operational control. You still control your staff and all that. In a lot of cases, Marriott also has a management team yeah. that you can hire that is trained with Marriott to come manage it. So they're do really you have to use them? No, you don't but have they're, to. But they're there to help kind of maintain yeah, the standard, help yeah, you do absolutely. it the right way. How come the old uh, owners are getting out on this deal? So it really depends. Uh, so people will get out of hotel deals. It could be for multiple reasons, just like any commercial deal. But a lot in the hotel space, it could be for one or two main reasons. Um, they're at the they're at the end life cycle of that whole period, which the whole period is anywhere between five to ten years. It could be could, could depend. The life cycle on a, on a on a hilt on a uh, hilt, um, hotel like a Marriott or even a Hilton is about five to seven years. Meaning, this is why you'll never see a super outdated Marriott. If you see one that's even a little bit dated, they're about to get get into that phase of where they're going to mm -hmm. start remodeling each room. Um, this is because Marriott has a standard to uphold, and you have to rehab it within that time frame. How, so how big is this $12 million Marriott? How many rooms is it? 115 keys. 115 keys. Mm -hmm. And you're, going, you're bringing some partners in? Yeah, we got to bring some partners in, and we're going to be raising some capital. Absolutely. Got it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And on this one, uh, are you able to get any kind of deal on it? Like, what makes this a yes for you? It is. Well, you know, just like we analyze any commercial deal, and that's, that's one of the things I love about real estate. To me, commercial real estate is like the pinnacle. That's as hard as it gets. Yeah. Like, to me, this doesn't get harder if you know how to evaluate, you know, cap rates, NOI, you know, how to, how to uh, equity multiples, average annual cash on cash return. Like, you, you can understand those metrics. So can we get, can I actually go through ballpark what they look at like on this? 
But I'm fully curious. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll put you on the spot. <laughs> You're 12 million all in. Yeah. 115 keys. Yes. Uh, you got to probably, it's at its rental cycle. So you've yes. got to do some renovation on it. Yes, we're going to put about. How much money you got to put down on this thing? Uh, is this like fifty percent down, thirty percent. We're putting thirty percent down. So thirty percent. So, mm -hmm. so you're raising twelve. So this is a thirty-six million dollar deal, or you're no, putting no, no. four down. No, we're putting four down. Putting you're, four put, down. you're putting four down. Mm -hmm. How much of that is for renovation? Uh, about a million two. A million two, and the mm -hmm. other two point eight is for down. Mm -hmm. And what do you think your monthly expense? What's your not going to be? Uh, so monthly. Totally out. The, total out the door, <laughs> ish. Okay. So, so the way we look at it, we look at the NOI. Okay. We look at the NOI. Okay, let's do it your way. <laughs> we look at the NOI. So, you know, we have an NOI of about 1.3. Yeah. NOI about 1.3, which is good. Which and is explain good. NOI for people listening. So NOI is the net operating income. Yeah. And that's NOI what you, is that, a... That, that's like what you, that's what you should make by the end of the day at the end of the year. That's what you should make literally all your expenses outside of your mortgage. So day one is you're, you're putting up four, mm -hmm. but your NOI is 1.3. 1.3. So you've got three years... A little bit more just to break even. And, and it'll go up once we do the remodel, too. Yeah, it'll go up it'll once we do the remodel. What do, you think your monthly gonna be what do you think your monthly positive cash flow is going to be? I mean, I guess if your NOI is 1.3, yeah, then 1 you're going to be making around a little $110,000 a month. Yeah, a month, yeah. And, and, and of course, that is, that's not including the... That's really, that's like, that's like a 30 to 40% cash on cash. Not bad. Not bad. How come you didn't call me? <laughs> I... I what, what was the first thing we said when we first came and sat down? I said, Chris, I got a deal for you. Okay, good. Okay, good. I, good. I just, listen, I'm just on the spot making sure we're still friends. Yeah, we're still friends, I okay, promise good. you. It's like, about, about to get pissed. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, for, for everyone listening, to, to be clear, so in the game of real estate, um, getting a 30% cash on cash is exciting. Yeah. You do single family, your cash on cash is going to be single digits. It's yeah. going to be, you know, three, four, five, six, seven, eight percent. Yeah. It's not 20%. Yeah. It's definitely not 25%. Yeah. That 30%, that's, that's pretty magic right there. Absolutely. And, and, you know, and when it comes to commercial real estate, especially like hotels, you want to just make sure you're, you're, you know, you're buying at a decent cap rate as well. Yeah. Like, the, to me, the cap rate is what how is you the even cap rate know. On this one? So, so they, were, they were offering it at like a 6.5 cap, but we're buying it at like an 8 cap. Okay, so you so yeah. you, you had some negotiation. Yeah, yeah, yeah how'd absolutely. you find this deal? Oh um, man, being in the game, man. I, I mean, Chris, honestly, I didn't buy one hotel last year, but I underwrit eighteen of them. Hmm. Right, you're and making that, a point right now. <laughs> Are you saying that you control eighteen? No, 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 no. I underwrit and passed on. 18. Got it. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Like now, you, you know, now, because I, I say all that to say you may, you may, take, you may kiss a few frogs but find that, that right deal for yeah. you, right? Not all deals make sense. Matter of fact, most of them won't even pencil out for you. But the ones that you're able to negotiate to get to pencil out, then you, you make it. But, I, you know, you, you, you won't find a slam dunk deal. You'll find a great deal. You got to go through You got to hustle and find a great deal. Go through the trench. You gotta Listen, go through the um, we've got 2024 in front of us. Yeah. What's your prediction? Tell me about the real estate market. Man, great question. It's interesting, ain't it? This capital market is crazy mm -hmm. right now. For, for one, you know, we see a lot of we see a lot of news about about interest rates coming down. We don't necessarily know though if inflation is going to go the direction that, that they want it to go. I do, in my opinion though. I do anticipate it coming down. I don't know if it's going to be a four point six times six four times six. I don't know. I do anticipate it coming down. I think even the slightest drop is going to cause, uh, it's, it's, going to, it's going to look very different 2024 than this 2023, 2023. I think, I think prices are likely going to increase because of this. I think buyers are going to flood the market. Um, I think that this is why, if you can understand and learn how to do deals yeah. outside of the bank, yeah. doing deals Subject twos, outside Sub the bank. Sub twos, owner finance. Do deals without getting the bank involved. Either you let the seller be your bank or take over the loan that's already there. Yeah. If you can literally master the inner workings of these kind of deals, even lease options as a form of credit financing, then, man, you could really, really take advantage of what's, what's about to come. Yeah. Honestly, I just think even if people do traditional financing with where the price of homes are going, yeah. the glut of missing inventory and the inventory that's going to start hitting the market. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're, we're going to be upside down for years. Yeah. 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 I agree. I Low agree. rates stimulate the economy. I've got my predictions on what I think. What do you As think? In fact, I'll let you weigh in on this know. one. Pace Morby and I, we were talking about single family homes. Yeah. 
And uh, we both agreed. We, we, it was hard to make a bet with him if we both agreed on the bet. But the bet was, he's like, Chris, I'll bet you 100 bucks. I'm like, wow, this is, <laughs> this is high stakes Pace who did a, like nine stuff. figures in revenue on his company last year. I'm like, okay, Pace, we'll, we'll bet $100. What are we betting it on? He says by the end of 2024, the median will, will, will bump to over half a million. I said, I can't make that bet because I agree. Oh. Now, that's where we are at because we are definitely in the single family game right now. We're starting off the year at hmm. 431,000. So when you think about that going to 500, that's like, that's a very aggressive prediction but i'm kind of curious what do you think about it i you know what it's not far-fetched i would probably give that prediction two years um i don't know if by, by the end of the year yeah but i'll probably give it within two years by the end of 2025 yeah. i will not that's very fair to make by i think 24 months it's going to be a hundred thousand higher i think it's going to be 530 <laughs> I, think I, so. do. I do i do uh, but no, I like your, your, your prediction is aggressive and yet yeah, still safe. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I got to play a little. I got to be a little. No, but you know, I mean, to anyone that is, that is just like, oh man, half of what you guys said kind of went a little bit. If you're newbie, you're, you're going to hear all sorts of things out of our mouth. Where you're like, I don't know that jargon yet. That's a little over my head. But here's, there's a bottom line lesson. TJ started in single family. Yeah. He absolutely. didn't start buying a Marriott. No. He started in single family and, and he bought, he, he started building an initial portfolio and then he ventured. He played some games, some worked, some didn't. He's found a way to get most of those games to work. And last year he underwrote 18 deals and put mm. them in the trash can. Yep. <laughs> um, and yet what we both agree on is that bottom line is the appreciation on real estate in the next two years is going to be high. I do think so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was talking to a guy who said, well, I'm not into real estate. I've always wanted to be. And during the pandemic, my house went up hundred grand. And my question was, huh, what if you had had nine more? Mm. He needed the math. He's like, well, I, I would have made a million dollars in a year. I said, welcome to my world. Yeah. Welcome to TJ's world. This is what happens when you, when you play this game. Yeah. Now you're playing it smart because you're playing on the cash flow side, which is very, very cool. Absolutely, man. Yeah. Uh, I, the cash flow is too important. To so um, for anyone that is, that is listening to this, um, that is thinking about getting into real estate, whether yeah. it's Airbnb, hotel game, or just yeah. even getting started with lease options or basic single families, uh, do you still recommend that same book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad? Oh, absolutely. And um, do you think now's a good entry point? I think there's never a bad entry point to get into real estate. I agree with you, but I don't think there's well, ever can, a bad I, can I ask you why? Um, People because, are like, dude, bro, I'm just going to play devil's advocate. Mm -hmm. The market has gone up so much, it eventually yeah. has to come down. Oh my God. And if I get in, it's going to come crashing down on me and I'm going to lose everything. <laughs> Response. <laughs> well, I, you know, we, just, we, we, gave, we talked about the example about timing yeah. earlier. There's a reason why they say buy it and wait. If the market's up and going crazy and properties are flying off the shelf, okay. Um, that means that that's not a bad time to get in. Um, if the market's down, that's actually, to me, is even a more favorable time to get in, to me, because then you can buy the properties at a, at a discount. Is it harder to get good deals? Yes, but if you can just figure it out. Yep. If you can figure it out, put the time in a little bit to just increase your intellectual acuity on and the skills on how to, how to do these kind of deals, then you'll be in a way better shape than when it comes up. So... It doesn't matter what cycle real estate game is. I agree there's with you. still definitely, there's never a bad But you got to be playing the right strategy. You d that's the thing. Right. You have to play like right strategy for the right time. 2008, um, everyone was licking their wounds, leaving their real estate back with the banks. Yep. They were taking foreclosures. They're going bankrupt. And everyone's like, this is the worst time. And I had the hard, I didn't have social media back then. But in 2009, I went into the market and started buying literally thousands of homes. Crazy. And I was like, guys, this is the best thing ever. And they're like, are you kidding me? I bought my house for 400 grand and it's worth 150 grand. What do you mean it's a great time? I'm like, you crazy. I just bought your house for 150 grand. For 150. Grand. Right? And, and when, I, when I explained the math, they're like, how is this good? I said, well, first of all, when, when, when the real estate bubble pops and prices go down, the population doesn't go down. Mm -hmm. They said, what do you, what you mean? I'm like, facts. People, but listen, people lose their jobs. They have more time to make more babies. Like, pe people don't disappear. They, they got to rent. All they're doing is shifting from owner game yeah. to the yeah. rental game. It's yeah. the same population. Yeah. Um, and then I said, furthermore, I was buying house for, I bought a house in Phoenix for $90,000, and this would happen every single time. The insurance company would come out and say, okay, well, we're insuring it for uh, 210. And... Um, I, when I would work with my partners, they would get irate and they said, excuse me, I just bought it for 90. If I, if I, if I have to insure it for 210, then I'm paying twice as much money for my insurance. Mm. And, and so they would ask the insurance company, why do I have to insure for 210 if I bought it for 90? They said, because sir, ma'am, if your house burns down and I have to replace it, 
it cost me two hundred and ten thousand dollars, and that's when the light bulb went on for them. The They're like, that good. "Whoa, whoa, 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 what?" <laughs> and I just said, "Yeah." Now you just wait five years. We don't build for five years, and we are going to have people coming out of our ears and not enough roofs. Wow. And that's exactly what happened. And so everything RV'd. It went up through the roof. And every time I insured a property for more than double or triple than what I was buying it for, I had a big smile on my face. But my investors who didn't get it, they were nervous. <laughs> so it, it was a beautiful entry point. And yeah, I agree with I you. It's it. always a good time to buy real estate. I'm just particularly excited about 2004 because when you know the market is about to take a very significant oh, yeah. bump yes. in the last 20 years, that was 08. Run it. Leading up to that, that was 2020 with the pandemic. And I think it's 2024 and 2025. Absolutely. And, I agree. Um, so we, we got Tom on our side. So if anyone's listening, like, dude, you think... TJ, you Get think now's the, the now's the time? Get in the game. Now's the time. Get in the game. How, if they want to get in the game with you, how do they find you? Uh, definitely tap in with me at TJ Tajani. That's T J T I J A N I. Um, and definitely find me on Instagram, really all social media. TJ, tap you're in. everywhere, bro. I'm you're, everywhere. you're everywhere. You're all over social. I'm you're everywhere. killing it. You're crushing it. I'm really proud of you. Thanks so much, brother. And uh, I want so to thank you for Thanks. being here today. No worries. No worries. Listen, I love coming here. I love coming to Utah. You know, can I, can I share a quick story when I first came to Utah? So here's what's crazy. Uh, I came. I came here. First time I come here. Came here was 2022, and I came here in June of 2022. When we came here to shoot content, and uh, man, it was one of those long days. We shot content for like 10, 10 hours, and we were the drivers taking me back home. And just so, just like, because usually when I go back to my room, I order food, and then she asked me. She said, "Well, TJ, do you want to stop and grab something to eat before you get to your hotel?" I said, "Man, great call. Yes." Let's stop and grab something to eat. And I, look, I pulled up some on my, on, my, uh, on my phone real quick. I said, yeah, we can stop. And she stopped. I go in there. Um, it, was like a, it was like a Vietnamese spot. I go in there. Um, I'm standing there at the counter. And to my right, there's this big table. It's a round table, and it's just filled. You can tell it's a family. And in this table, you can tell it's a mom and dad, and the, some grandparents are there, and some kids are there. And so I looked at the table. Okay, cool. And I'm ordering my food. And the grandfather at the table is staring at me. He's just staring at me. And listen, I'm like, man, listen, I ain't seen not one black person this entire time I've been here. <laughs> I was like, so I, let me just get my food and bounce, right? So, so, but he's like staring at me. And I'm like, I can feel him piercing his look. In my, and I'm ordering my food. I'm waiting on the food now. And I'm sitting there waiting. And he's still looking. I'm like, God dang, man, let me get my stuff and just bounce. Food comes. I, uh, I grab my food and I start walking out the door. Grandpa stands up, Chris, grabs my arm. I'm like, oh, man, man, what is this? Is this about to be some? And he, and he goes, hey, your hat. It says, what is that? Rentalpreneur. What is it? I was looking at it, trying to figure. And I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I said, well, that's just my brand, right? Rentalpreneur, that's my brand. I do real estate. He said, oh, man, awesome. You do real estate? Yeah. He said, what kind of real estate do you do? He said, yeah. I said, yeah, I actually do a lot of Airbnbs. He said, no way. My granddaughter was literally just talking about Airbnb. And she goes, hey, meet this young man. He said he does Airbnb. And then he says, do you want to sit down? Do you want to sit down? So I'm now sitting at this table with this Caucasian family. Sure. I'm sitting there, and I'm just talking to him, giving a whole master class on Airbnb. I text the driver, give him about 10 more minutes. I'm wow. <laughs> giving a whole master class about Airbnbs. They were so grateful. They all followed me on Instagram. The people in you start the pretty nice, so, aren't so, they? Exactly. so I say all that to say, listen, it's always great energy here. Yeah, <laughs> right? yeah. I love coming. I appreciate you having me, brother. TJ, appreciate you, man. And everyone else, please follow TJ. See what he's up to, and we'll join you guys on the next Chris Crone Show. Peace. Peace.